All right, praise the Lord. Wow, what a blessed day this this is. This must be one of the greatest days in the world. We get to read Matthew chapter 5 as well. And of course, Matthew chapter 5 is the Sermon on the Mount, which is undoubtedly the most famous sermon in all of history. So let's read this together. It says, One day, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, and he sat down. And his disciples came to him, and they gathered around him. And he began to teach them. And here's what he said. He said, blessed are the poor, or in spirit, or God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. I did a lot of studying on that one time, and that's exactly what I came up as my own conclusion. That when he says the poor in spirit, he doesn't mean those that are, you know, poor, looking for food, looking for a handout, but those who are poor in spirit, those who realize their need for him. Uh, and for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. When you come to a place in your life where you realize you need God, you need Jesus, you need the Holy Spirit, well, there's something about that heart cry to God that God hears, and he gives you what you're seeking for. The Bible says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything will be given unto you. And so he says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice or righteousness, to be right with God, when what you want more than anything else in life is to be right in the eyes of God. He says, man, you'll be filled, you'll be satisfied, your life will go well. I'm not saying everything will go the way you want it to go. I'm not saying it's some kind of a magic pill because, frankly, you could be very self-centered and seek good things in life at God's expense instead of saying, God, I want you, I want to be right with you more than anything. We read in the book of Genesis how Cain brought his offering to the Lord and the Lord wasn't pleased with Cain's offering. doesn't tell us why, just tells us that he was. He wasn't pleased. And instead of saying, God, what have I done? Have I offended you? How can I make you happy? What could I have done differently? I want to do better next time. Cain was angry. And God actually spoke to him and said, be careful because sin is trying to destroy you. You need to master it. Well, we need to get a hold of our hearts and say, hey, what's really important in life, what really matters in life, and put God first and desire to be right with him more than anything else because you'll be filled, you'll be satisfied, you'll be blessed. Verse 7, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I've noticed over the years one of the greatest problems that people have is the ability just to forgive people. I've seen people carry little bitty grudges for years and years and years and have very negative opinions of each other over very insignificant things that that person did. In fact, I remember in the Old Testament it says in one place, be very careful how you listen to what people say about you because you know that you've done the same thing to them in private. Well, be very careful how we judge other people. Be merciful. Give people a break. Don't always hold them accountable for every little thing they do. God will bless you when you show them mercy. And it says God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. And friend, we live in a very filthy world And we need to really watch our heart. We need to watch our eyes, what we allow ourselves to watch. We need to watch our ears. And we can't say to ourselves all the time, oh, it won't bother me. It won't affect me. No, it will. It can. So make sure that you're working hard to keep your heart pure before God because then you'll see God. Not Not only will you see him one day in heaven, but you'll see him in the world around you when you keep your heart pure. Verse 9, God blesses those who work for peace for they'll be called the children of God. And it's I've found in the, over the years as a pastor that working to be a peacemaker, says blessed are the peacemakers. Working to be a peacemaker is kind of messy work because you tell somebody that they ought to forgive somebody else. Well, they don't necessarily want to hear that, and they might get mad at you in the process. And so try to help people see things from a different perspective. Sometimes they don't want to see. They'd just rather be mad. And they'd rather be all full of themselves and think they're the only one that's right and they're the only one that matters but God blesses those who work for peace so if you're working to make peace between somebody and somebody else and it's not going well well then just take heart because God will bless you just because you're working for peace even if you don't necessarily achieve it 
if you're just working towards it, if that's your goal, to help people love each other and respect each other and get along with each other, God will bless you and you'll be called the children of God. Now, maybe that person won't call you the children of God, but God himself in heaven, the angels of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they'll call you a child of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing what's right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Amen. God blesses you when people mock you, when they persecute you, when they lie about you, and they say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Now, you're not blessed just because people don't like you. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you're blessed when they don't like you because of me, when they don't like you because you're following God. When you say, no, I don't want to go to that party. I don't want to get involved in that thing. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to repeat that story. I don't want to believe that gossip or whatever it is that you don't get involved in. They might not like you because you're not like them. And of course, they'll even blame you and say, oh, you're goody two shoes. You're, you think you're better than everybody. You say, no, I'm just trying to make God happy. I'm just trying to please my heavenly father. And they might say all sorts of evil things about you because you're God's follower. And he says, if that happens, well, then rejoice, be, be happy. In fact, he says, be happy about it. Don't just put up with it. Don't just endure it. Be happy. If you've come to a place where you're taking such a stand for God that other people are mad at you for it, be happy. Be very glad because a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, even the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. He says, you're the salt of the earth. Well, the salt purifies, doesn't it? Back in the old days, they would put salt on a wound to purify that wound. And of course, they put salt in food and that preserves the food from spoiling. Well, you're the salt of the earth. And so you're different. You stand out. You make a difference. But he says, what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? And of course, the salt that you have in the cabinet today, I don't believe it can lose its flavor. But if you take natural salt that just comes up out of the ground and uh, after a while, the flavor can be leached out of it and it's not good for anything you can't put it on a field to make the crops grow you can't use it for anything and so he says if you're the salt of the earth but you've become just like the world well what good are you can you make it salty again this other salt no he says that kind of salt this salt that leaches out the flavor he says this can be thrown out and trampled underfoot is worthless he says you're the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And so he says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see. Now, in one place, Jesus says, when you give to the poor, don't announce it. Don't, he compares it to people having someone go before them with a trumpet, you know, blowing the trumpet to get everybody's attention to announce that they're giving to the poor. Well, what he's saying there is don't be proud and don't want the approval of people. But on the other hand, he says, let your light shine. Let your good deeds shine for all to see. Why? Not so that they'll praise you and think, aren't you wonderful because you give so much to the poor or you do all these good things, but so that everybody will praise your heavenly father. You see, it's a, a bad thing to talk about what you do to help other people if you're doing that just to get praise for yourself. That's pride. That's self-centered. But if you talk about the good things you do because you want to tell people how wonderful Jesus is and how he's put God's love in your heart and now you love people and you want to help people and do good for them, well, that's giving praise to your Heavenly Father. And in that way, you should be letting people know what your good deeds are. He says, don't misunderstand why I've come. Why did Jesus come to the earth? He said, I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses. Now, again, this is the book of Matthew, and Matthew was written to the Jews. The, Matthew was a Jew, and he wrote to the Jewish people about this man, Jesus, to explain who he was. And Jesus said to the Jews, I didn't come to abo abolish the Jewish law that Moses gave us or the writings of all the Jewish prophets. He said, no, I came to accomplish their purpose. What was the purpose? To make people right with God, to bring them back to God again, right? And so Jesus was the way that man could be forgiven 
and made right with God again. He said, I came to accomplish the purpose. Why did the law come? Why did the prophets come? Well, they came to help man get right with God again. Amen. And so he said, I came to be the key to make that happen. He said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until his purpose is achieved. And so if you ignore the least commandment, he's talking to the Jews here, if you ignore the least commandment of the Jewish law and teach others to do the same, you'll be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anybody who obeys God's law and teaches them to others will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so, friend, you maybe never wrote a book, you never started a church, you don't have a big record contract where you're singing Christian songs. But I tell you what, if you obey God's laws and you teach them to your children, you mention them to friends and family, then you'll be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Praise the Lord. He said, but I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the Jewish religious law and the Pharisees, these Jewish religious leaders, he said, unless your righteousness is better than that, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, now why? Because, see, friend, they they looked wonderful on the outside. They dressed just right in their religious clothing, and they spoke just right with their religious terminology. They went to the synagogue. They they followed all the the, uh, Jewish religious rules and regulations. But Jesus said in their hearts they weren't right with God. They were hateful, lustful, greedy, selfish people. And God doesn't approve of that no matter what you do on the outside. Amen. And he says, you've heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, then you're subject to judgment. But I say, if you're even angry with somebody without cause, then you're subject to judgment. If you call somebody an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. In fact, I was talking to somebody today, by the way, we need to be careful about what we call people, even if we're teasing Be careful. The Bible says don't let bad words, evil words, mean words, hurtful words come out of your mouth. Don't let them come out of your mouth. Not just don't let them come out of your heart. Don't let them come out of your mouth. And so I know it's fun to play and tease with people. but We have to be very careful that we don't cut with our words and hurt people accidentally, even if we're teasing them. And so here, though, again, of course, intentionally, if you'd call somebody an idiot, then you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse somebody, you're in danger of the fires of hell. He said, now, the Old Testament law, the Jewish law, said don't kill somebody. And if you kill somebody, you're going to be brought before the Jewish courts, and you'll be guilty of and maybe sentenced to death, depending on exactly how that death happened. But Jesus said, I don't want you to even talk mean to people. Just don't talk ugly to people. He says, if you curse somebody, you're in danger of the fires of hell. And he says, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and so again, he's talking to the Jews, and the Jews, whenever they sinned, they would go to the temple and they would offer a sacrifice, and it would be a way of paying God back for what they did wrong. Probably the simplest way to say it. Trying to make it right with God for what they've done to somebody else. And so he says, if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that somebody has something against you, well, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Don't think you're getting right with God just because you go to church. Don't think you're getting right with God just because you faithfully bring your tithes and your offering to the church. You should bring your tithes and your offerings. That's, That's a biblical principle. But he says, don't think that's all you need to do. He says, instead, go and be reconciled to that person. If you suddenly realize that somebody has something against you, and I believe the way that that's worded means that they actually have something against you. You've done something. Not that they're just mad at you for no reason, but they have a reason. And if you're trying to get right with God, well, then get right with that person because God loves that person. That would be like saying, you know, a brother and a sister maybe. And you go out there and you slap somebody's sister across the face and call her an ugly name. Then you go try to hang out with a brother. He's going to say, buddy, what are you doing here? Now, you don't have any business being with me. Look what you did to my sister. Well, God feels the same way when we treat his children ugly. Then we go try to hang out with him. He doesn't like that very much. So he says, go and be reconciled to that person. And then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So when you're on the way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. And I like that. That's that's very important here. Try to fix it quickly. If you've hurt somebody, fix it as quickly as you can. Uh, You know, don't let them hurt for a long time for a couple of reasons. One, because they don't need to hurt. Uh, I mean, it sounds stupid to say it, but it hurts to hurt. And when somebody's hurting in their heart, 
and you have the ability to fix it, well then why wait? If you love them at all, if you have any kind of the love of God in your heart, why would you wait and let them just suffer because you've hurt them? No. And then secondly, the longer you let it stay in their heart before you fix it, the harder it is to fix it. It's like a plant and the root just grows deeper and deeper. The Bible even warns us to not let a root of bitterness enter in and defile us or make us filthy on the inside. So settle it quickly. And then he says, otherwise your accuser may hand you over to the judge. He's going to hand you over to an officer and you'll be thrown into prison. And by the way, if you are ugly with other people, you know what? You can actually end up in a prison in your own mind uh, because you're mad at somebody. You can be out eating a $100 steak at a fine restaurant and not enjoying a single bite of it because in your mind all you're thinking about is that person that you're mad at and you're angry with them and it makes everything miserable. And so be careful that you'll be thrown into prison. You, you may end up losing your salvation over how badly you treat somebody. But even if you don't do that, let's say you get into heaven by the hair of your chinny chin chin, like the Bible talks about in, Cor in the Corinthians, first or second, I can't recall right this minute, that some will be saved as by fire. Everything they do will be burned up, but they themselves will be saved. Well, maybe you make it to heaven, but you spend a pretty miserable life here on the earth just because you don't know how to forgive somebody or make it right with someone that you've offended. And so he says, if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you've paid the last penny. Verse 27, you've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. So again, talking to the Jews, they had the Jewish law, and the law said you must not commit adultery. Jesus said, but I say, now I want you to hear this because this is not me talking, this is Jesus. Jesus said, but I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So what do you think Jesus thinks about pornography? And what do you think Jesus thinks about even looking at things where women are dressed in a certain way or men are dressed in a certain way and it raises naughty images and feelings in your heart? What are you going to do about that? You're just going to say, well, that's just natural. Everybody does it and nobody cares. I'm not doing anything and I'm not hurting anybody. Well, Jesus says, I say, Anybody who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, now in the Old Testament law, the adulterers were stoned to death. So it's a pretty serious crime. In the New Testament, we know that we know we cannot be perfect. And we're trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ to cover our sins and wash us clean before God and to make us right in his sight. So we know we're righteous by faith. But John says in 1 John uh, chapter 1, no, First John chapter 2, he said, I write these things to you that you would not sin. And if we have sin, of course, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He pleads our case before God the Father, but that doesn't mean that we ought to just live in sin. In fact, in Romans chapter 6, St. Paul says, what shall we say to these things about grace and mercy and forgiveness? Shall we continue in sin? so that God can give us more mercy? God forbid. How shall we that have died to sin live in sin? And so be careful. We don't allow the normal practices of the world to become normal to us. They shouldn't at all. We should walk in a very much higher level of holiness in our hearts. And so don't commit adultery with a woman or a man in your heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Verse 30, and if your hand, even your stronger hand, your good hand, your right hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. He says, you've heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. The Jewish law included that provision that if a man and a woman were getting along he could just say well I'm going to write you a little paper up here and now we're divorced. It was very very easy to get divorced in that day. He said but I say that a, a man who divorces his wife unless she's been unfaithful causes her to commit adultery and anybody who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. And again adultery was very very serious crime in those days and so we shouldn't just divorce people. What we ought to do is try to find a solution. People today will get divorced at the drop of a hat and they'll say, well, we have irreconcilable differences. What they really mean is we don't get along and I don't want to try. 
Now, I'm not saying that you need to stay in a home with somebody who's trying to hit you in the head with a baseball bat or hit you with a hammer in the head. That, don't stay with them. But if they just, you know, they don't squeeze the toothpaste the right way or they leave their underwear on the floor and so you say you've had it, you know, with, with them, well, that's not very godly. You need to find strength and grace to find a way to bring love into that home again and bring respect and, and bring, you know, kindness and all that sort of stuff, forgiveness into that home. And maybe you need to be the, the one that's going to start it because somebody's got to start it. Somebody's got to plant a seed if you want to harvest a crop. Amen? Amen. Verse 33 says, You've also heard that our ancestors were told you must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. He said, But I say don't make any vows. Um, I've always tried to say over the years, like it says in the book of James, don't say I'm going to go here or there and be here tomorrow. And just say if the Lord wills. And sometimes people think it's funny or they think it's odd that I'm trying to get out of making a commitment, but I'm not at all. Because the fact of the matter is, you know, if I say, well, I'll see you tomorrow, I think it's better to say I'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing. Meaning, you know, if we're still here, I might not be alive tomorrow. You might not be alive tomorrow. You know, we may all be raptured before then, or one of us may not make it. You know, we, we don't know. Maybe we'll be suddenly called away to some emergency. Maybe the boss needs us, or maybe we have a death in the family. He said, and he, so he says, don't promise you're going to do anything if you can help it. And certainly don't say, heaven's going to back me up on it. Because you don't know God's will about tomorrow, some, most of the time. Sometimes the Lord will reveal something to you very specifically, but... Uh, most of the time, we're just believing the best. But he says, heaven is God's throne. Don't lightly call on the authority of God's throne. And he says, don't say by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. Apparently in those days, some of the Jews, would, someone would say, hey, will you uh, go into business with me? Yes. Will you do this? Yes. Will you? How about if I provide this and you provide that? You know, I'll provide this service. You provide this much money? Yes. And they'd shake hands on it. And, and then maybe one of them would make an oath and say, well, by God's hell, you know, with I promise you by the throne of God, they'd go over the top. You know, just say yes. Just let your yes be yes and be faithful to do what you say you're going to do and don't bring God into it and make it look as if something didn't happen. Now it's God's fault. Well, it's not God's fault. You just messed up. So don't bring God into this and act like it's all him. Anyway, so don't say by the earth because the earth is his footstool. Don't say by, by Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the city of the great king. And don't even say by my head for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple yes, I will or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Don't be calling on God in that way. Don't be calling God as your witness. You've heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's actually an Old Testament law. You can see it written here in Exodus and Leviticus and also in Deuteronomy. He said, but I say don't resist an evil person. If somebody slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. And friend, that's a hard one right there, isn't it? Because who wants to just stand there if somebody's punching you. You don't want to be a punching bag, especially we're talking about women who are abused wives. Or maybe I've known a few abused husbands over the years as well. But I think what he's saying is just don't be someone who's always angry. Don't be someone who's looking for a way to get even. Or someone who says, well, if you do this to me, then I'll just do twice as bad to you. Well, friend, then the argument will never stop. Let's say your husband comes home and he forgets to do something or other. So you say, I'll show him. I'll do twice as evil to him tomorrow. Well, then what if he says, well, you did this to me, so now I'll do twice as bad to you tomorrow. Well, friend, you're going to blow up your relationships that way. Please don't do that. Just try instead to turn the other cheek and be merciful. He said, if you're sued in court and your shirt's taken from you, well, then give them your coat too. And if a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile carry it two miles. Back in those days, the Romans actually had the legal right. The Roman soldiers could walk up to any Jewish citizen and say, I need you to carry my pack down the road for a mile. And they were required by law to do that. Just like we have laws in America today that if you see an accident and you don't help, you can actually get a ticket or you can get a fine or maybe even go to jail for refusing to help in a time of need. Well, they had the ability to say, you need to carry my pack. And so Jesus said, you know, when they do that to you, don't get mad about it. Don't fuss about it and don't ruin your life and ruin your day about it. Carry it two miles. 
And when they ask you why you're doing that, tell them because I love God. He's done so much for me. Use it as a chance to witness. Amen. Just have a good attitude. Jesus is digging down into our hearts and saying, I want you to have a good attitude. And he says, give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Amen. Be kind. Be generous. You've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who persecute you. I've actually got an entire message just on that verse right there. Because I've noticed one time, he says, love your enemies, bless those who curse you. So if they something, if they say something evil, you say something good. If they hate you, then do something. No, in other words, here they just said something evil. But now they really hate you. They're going farther than just saying something mad. You know, hey, get out of my face, you know idiot but then they forget about you but this person really hates you and this person's actually going beyond hating you they're persecuting you so the worse they get the more they hate you the more they begin to manifest hatred to you you become more and more spiritual here you just bless them here you do good and here you pray for those you get more and more into the spirit and becoming more powerful in combating their hatred amen he says in that way you'll be acting like true children of god your Father in heaven, because he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. He said, if you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. And if you're only kind to your friends, how are you different from anybody else? Even pagans do that. And so I think we need to be kind, and we need to be good to everybody. Amen? Not just your friends. Don't don't go into a crowd and just look for your friends all the time. But even say, especially if you're going to church, don't just sit by your friend all the time and ignore the guy sitting on the other side of you. Reach out your hand. Introduce yourself. Be nice. Be outgoing. You say, well, I'm not naturally outgoing. Great. Most people are not. I learned that when I was about 20 years old or so. All of a sudden, one day, I went, you know what? I think pretty much everybody's shy. And there's hardly anybody that's outgoing. And if I'll just go ahead and make it a habit to be outgoing, even if I don't feel like it, I think things will change in my life. And I was amazed how many friends I started to make when I got out of my comfort zone and decided to be kind to people that weren't necessarily my friends. But he says, if you're only kind to your friends, you're just doing even what the unbelievers do. Do better than that because you have a heavenly father. He says, you're supposed to be perfect and mature, growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character, right? Growing, continually grow in godliness and in mind and character. Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Amen? Amen. And wow, we could spend hours and hours. We spent about half an hour here just on that chapter, but we could have spent about 10 or 20. But praise God for the beautiful, beautiful Sermon on the Mount. Amen.